Welcome, everyone. There's a Christmas in the air, right? It's fun, <laughs> I guess we have to admit to that. Um, but I'm glad you all are here today. We'll warm things up by singing our first hymn, which is on page one in your bulletin. If you would all please stand and join. secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Son of God. 
from the book of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor, together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a, <clears throat> I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read together Psalm 126. To the Hebrews. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing, continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. This he did once for all, for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. Lord, take me where you want me to go. Let me meet who you want me to meet. Tell me what you want me to say and please keep me out of your way. Amen. Please be seated. We only have a few more weeks left in the church year of Mark. That is, to hear the readings from the Gospel of Mark before we move into the Gospel of Luke. And there are a few things that I want to say about Mark before we move on. First, it's the oldest of the Gospels written down. It references Nero's persecution of Christians which occurred in 64 AD. But it doesn't reference the destruction of the temple. One of the great wonders of the ancient world, which occurred in 70 AD. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke do reference that destruction. And had it occurred in time to be included, surely Mark would not have left out something so dramatic and painful as the destruction of the temple of the Jews. So with that in mind, its original date is somewhere between 64 AD and 69. The writer of Mark was not one of the original disciples, but church tradition holds that he was a companion of Paul and Peter. The gospel contains memories of the original eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. But the author was not personally present at the events that he narrates. Their value does not depend on their accuracy as history, you see, though they may represent actual historical events. They were preserved as expressions of Christian faith in what God had done in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mark was written to be read aloud in the worship service of early Christian communities, and it was designed to be read straight through. I highly recommend you try that sometime. I know from experience it will take you one hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's an epic story, and it's one well worth your time. The story of blind Bartimaeus acts as bookends in Mark's gospel. It closes out a long section that began back in chapter 8, when Jesus healed another blind man. This whole section has come to its climax here in chapter 10, where we've been walking with Jesus this whole month. The itinerary Jesus and his disciples have been following as they travel from Capernaum I'm sorry, Galilee to Jerusalem has been pretty eventful. 
They start off on this 85 mile hike, stopping outside Capernaum long enough for Jesus to teach some important things about divorce and welcoming little children to come to him. But there they are soon on the road again when they run into that rich young ruler. Remember him from a couple of weeks ago? And we discussed just what his lesson for us was. Jesus goes on to explain for the third time since that first blind man was healed how he would be arrested, beaten, and killed once they got to Jerusalem. But on they go nonetheless. And along the way, James and John ask a special favor of Jesus, which doesn't make them popular with the rest of the disciples when they find out. And Jesus takes that opportunity to teach them how those who would be great must become servants of all. In the span of just 45 verses, we've traveled from Capernaum to Jericho, which is just 15 miles from Jerusalem. This is where we finally meet the blind son of Timaeus, begging beside the road. This is quite literally a turning point. You see, Jericho is where you stop going south and head west, back over the Jordan River. The disciples are about a day and a half at this point away from Jerusalem. The only thing that lies between them and Jericho, from Jericho to Jerusalem, is the valley of the shadow of death. A dangerous place indeed. They just have made the turn and come through the city of Jericho when they meet the blind beggar Barnabas. And he knows something. He knows something that the disciples apparently still don't know yet. He knows who Jesus is. Bartimaeus, you see, recognizes, blind though he is, that Jesus is the Messiah. He knows that Jesus has the authority and power to heal. And healing is what Bartimaeus wants. He doesn't want a handout. He doesn't want pity. He doesn't even specify the nature of the mercy that he seeks until Jesus puts the question to him plainly. But he wants to see again. He knows he needs a fundamental change in his life. And the only thing that stands between Bartimaeus and the healing power of Jesus is the disciples. Think about that for a moment. It's the people crowding around Jesus as he leaves Jericho who discourage Bartimaeus from calling out to be healed. It's the closest followers of Jesus who tell Bartimaeus to be quiet, to leave the master alone. The very people who want to be closest to Jesus are the same people who are keeping others from him. These good church people, folks like us, are just trying to keep the riffraff out, right? These good church people, <coughs> folks just like us, only want the best for Jesus. They won't, don't want him to be pestered by a noisy, bothersome blind man who is creating a traffic jam on the road to Jerusalem. Mostly, they don't want to think about giving up their own spot near the master so that someone else can get near to him. <clears throat> but notice what Jesus does. He stops walking. He stands very still. He looks beyond the crowd that is surrounding him, looking for his attention. And he makes room for one more. He says to his disciples, call him over here. 
these disciples who see themselves as Jesus' most loyal followers, who just asked him to let them sit next to him on his right and his left in glory, these faithful few who were shushing Bartimaeus just a few moments ago, suddenly have to act as if they care. When Jesus says, call him over here, he is reminding the disciples that following means inviting others to come along for the journey. It means welcoming others into the group. It means making room for someone who was an outsider and inviting that person to become, well, an insider. When Bartimaeus learns that Jesus is calling him, he throws off his cloak. And this is no small gesture. He is blind, remember. The chances of him finding his life-preserving garment again is small. And he hurries, stumbles, no doubt, towards the voice of Jesus. And Jesus asked Bartimaeus a simple but remarkable question. What do you want me to do for you? What makes it remarkable is the fact that Jesus just asked this question of John and James in last week's gospel. When they asked if they could sit on his right and on his left in the kingdom. And isn't it interesting that James and John pull Jesus aside so others won't hear him ask for these places of honor. But this outcast, this blind beggar Bartimaeus, hollers out loud for the mercy that only Jesus can offer. And he does not care who hears him cry out loud. Bartimaeus gets right to the point. Rabani, I want to see again. Calling Jesus my teacher, Rabani, shows the humility of Bartimaeus. He submits himself, you see, to Jesus' authority. His request is simple. He wants his eyesight back. Unlike the man from chapter 8 who was born blind, Bartimaeus remembers what it was like to be able to see. He knows what he has been missing all this time. For me, this blindness is a metaphor. I have to ask, folks, do you know what you're missing? In what ways are we blind to God's kingdom? How have we lost our vision? How do I, our, de, our ideas of who belongs in church prevent us from seeing the Bartimaeuses all around us? <clears throat> the people that are in the margins of our world who want to be healed by God's mercy and they're just waiting to be called to join. How can we improve our vision to begin to see as Jesus sees? And how do we respond when Jesus calls us over and asks us what we want him to do for us? Are we bold enough? Are we humble enough to say, Lord, let me see again. Folks, Jesus doesn't have to touch Bartimaeus. All he has to do is speak, and Bartimaeus is healed. The only other time Jesus has said, your faith has made you well in the Gospel of Mark, was to a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. We heard her story a few weeks ago. She was determined to have a personal connection with Jesus. She knew if she but touched the hem of his cloak that she would be healed when he passed by. She worked hard to 
put herself in a position so that she too could be healed, like Bartimaeus has done. Jesus tells him to go just as he has told others who have received miracles of healing to go. Don't linger. Go on. But not this time. This person is not going to follow Jesus' order. It says right here in this gospel, he is healed and he follows Jesus on the way. He follows him to Jerusalem and to the foot of the cross. Bartimaeus goes from sitting on the side of the road to following Jesus all the way to Calvary. There's, more, there's room for one more after all. The disciples might have been keeping others away from Jesus in their efforts to get close to him or to protect him in some way for some reason, but Jesus always welcomes one more. It isn't a position of honor on Christ's right or left, but our position at the foot of Christ's cross that matters. And there's always room for one more at the foot of the cross. Jesus opens his arms to all who trust in him. Whatever has been preventing you from putting your trust in Jesus, well, you can throw it aside just like Bartimaeus tossed away his cloak. There's room for you at the foot of the cross. And whatever has been keeping you from welcoming others to join you here at St. Anne's, know that you can let that go too. Let go of your need to keep this a secret to yourself. Know that you can let go of any inhibitions you have about letting people know how important your faith is to you. Folks, may we all have ears to hear and eyes to see that there is glory enough and mercy enough for all of us. Let me close with prayer. Oh Lord, we want to see. Open our eyes to your love for us and to the need for your love in the world around us. Free us from our tendency to judge others. Humble us. Remind us that in order to shine with you in glory, we have to suffer with you and die to ourselves. And for those of us who may have put our trust in you long ago, but these days, our faith is more of a habit than the life-giving source of our deepest joy. I ask that you help us see again with fresh eyes. Let us return to the foot of your cross and let us make room for just one more beside us. Amen. Amen. If you would all please stand as you are able and turning to page five in your bulletin, join me in the reaffirmation of our faith by reciting the 19th. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, who in all things are made. Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin.
Prayers of the people. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For our bishop and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For Bridgehampton and every community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember <coughs> and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, degradation, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. that we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. In the communion of St. Anne's and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To thee, to thee O Lord our God. Heavenly Father, you have promised to hear that we ask what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <laughs> Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. So good to see you all. Please, have a seat. Delighted you guys are all here on this beautiful day. So glad to be worshiping back in the church. A couple of uh, announcements. Um, next weekend is Halloween, and it has, since I became a grandfather, it has been my tradition to spend the high holy day of Halloween with my grandchildren. So I will be flying down for a few days in Orlando uh, to dress up with Isla and Harry and baby Gareth. Um, in my place next weekend, we will have no less than the acclaimed actor, Terry Fiore, doing morning prayer. <laughs> Terry will be here, and I hope that you will come and support him uh, as he leads the service that morning. He will be doing 8.30 and 10 o'clock. Uh, morning prayer is shorter than the regular service, um, but nonetheless important, and a long-held worship service in the Episcopal Church. So I hope you'll be here that day to join Terry in worship. Um, uh, we're doing stewardship right now. Stewardship is kicking off, and I'm going to invite someone up in just a moment, but 
First, I want to let you know that we are going to be having a harvest supper at the end of the stewardship period. This is going to be on Sunday night, November 14th. It's a potluck. We'll be adding some food from the church, be added to it, but we're going to have a sign-up sheet. Carol Beinecke is in charge of this wonderful um, uh, dinner, and she will have a sign-up sheet soon uh, in the church. It's our first dinner back in the parish hall, and um, we're excited about that. We'll take all the proper precautions, but it's going to be fun to be back together inside and we'll hopefully have a roaring fire going in the fireplace and i hope that you will come there will we will meet first in the church at five o'clock you'll drop off your food over there so it can be organized and at five o'clock the pledge cards that have already been turned in or that you bring with you that day will be put in a basket and we will do a special blessing on them and for the remainder that still need to come in and then we will go over and we will celebrate. So I hope that you will put November 14th on your calendar. And I mentioned that I wanted to invite somebody else uh, up to speak a little bit about stewardship. Uh, Crosby Renwick is our senior warden. And Crosby, I'd like to invite you to come up and share um, uh, a few thoughts with us about stewardship, if you would. Well, uh, Jim asked me to talk about really why I come to St. Anne's and why I enjoy it here, um, I guess really do encourage everybody to support it. Um, really, there's, there's five reasons uh, that I come here. One, you know, live music every week, <laughs> free of charge. It's, I think it's excellent. Thank you. I enjoy that. I think, though, the most important reason I come here is because the, the sermons, the prayers, the songs are about universal moral truths. Things that have guided humans for 2,000 years, we know them to be true. Uh, and when I started coming here more often as I moved out from the city, that was important to me because in the city, it just seemed everything was about temporal things. Real estate, money, careers, restaurants, just the latest it thing. And there was nothing, it was all really millisecond mirages, nothing that you could rely on. Uh, and to me, coming here and, in, and listening, everything is true and it's been true for 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years. Um, and so I come here and I feel like I'm anchored in things that I can rely on, to know are true. Um, the third thing was, it took me a long time to realize that there's a lot of, there really is good and evil in this world. And there's a lot of evil people, a lot of bad people. Uh, but I feel here, it's a community of good people. Every, I know all of you have uh, goodness in your heart. And so I feel like when we get together, we're a community each week that are sort of protesting against these bad people and the evil that's out here, because it isn't here. Um, for, I also understand history better, the history of the world a lot better as I've understood religion better. Um, and so that to me is just sort of intellectually interesting. It's how the world has gotten on and not gotten on because of religion through the years. Uh, but finally, I think in the last 150 years where science has sort of answered all those vexing questions that People relied on religion to answer for them before. Interestingly, to me, it's, it's answered those questions, and we now know the miracles of physics, the miracles of the universe, the miracles of medicine, and how the body heals itself. And so I'm in awe of whatever had a hand in that, and I come here to bow down to that. It, uh, it feels good to bow down to something that is so much bigger than us. And that's, that's really why I come and, and why I support the church. Thanks. Thank you. Crosby is a, a, a wonderful model of a good and faithful servant, serving on the vestry and, and all the work that he does here. And he has been... Uh, intimately involved in all the painting and the, the, the work that's been happening on both buildings and our new roof. And we are truly blessed when someone brings their uh, gifts and skills and shares them. That's part of stewardship. 
um, with the church. And uh, Crosby uh, exemplifies that for all of us. And I see it on a daily basis because he gets calls or text messages from me every day, bless his heart. Um, but, and that is true. Um, our pledge cards and letters will be going out in the mail this week. So please look for them. Um, and as I said, please put November 14th down in your calendar. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God. Lord's table and everyone is welcome to receive communion from it. I have gluten-free wafers, just let me know if you want one and if you would prefer to come forward for a blessing, just cross your arms like this when you get to the rail and I will be happy to give you one. We are able to kneel again if you choose to do that or you may stand. The ushers will come and release you one pew at a time or two pews at a time to come forward. Um, we have the wine and the small glasses. When you take it, there are waistbands on either end as you walk by down the stairs for you to drop off the, the um, containers yourself. If you would all please stand as you are able. Our service continues on page eight. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy. Oh. 
thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days, you send him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with Bartimaeus and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. <coughs> By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. that Christ died for you and feed on in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing in all the wonders he has shown you. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again through our doors. Now go in peace, my friends, to follow the good road and may God's blessings be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn is on page 12. Please join our choir in singing.
Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.